Okay, I'm going to welcome everybody. Um, I am Catherine Frygang. I am from the Cornwall Conservation Trust and the Cornwall Conservation Commission. Um, welcome. And we're going to start our season of Ecology Talks. Today, we'll be hearing from Dr. Rob Clark, who is an insect ecologist at Great Hollow Nature Preserve and Ecological Research Center in New Fairfield, Connecticut, since 2021, which is when it actually started. This is a new venue for us all. We all have to go visit. His primary research interests include the roles of insects in forests and agricultural food webs and invasive insect management using advanced data science techniques. At Great Hollow, he's designing and leading studies involving tritropic interactions among plants, insects, and birds in forest food webs, invasive insect ecology, and citizen science as a tool to study forest entomology in large scale. Rob is originally from Connecticut. He earned his BS and MS in ecology and environmental science from Central Connecticut State University and his PhD in biology from Wesleyan University. He's an associate editor of the scientific journal Food Webs and holds adjunct faculty affiliations with Western Connecticut State University and Washington State University where he was previously an assistant research professor. Uh, Rob's going to explain what we're seeing in our Cornwall trees, the ash borers, pine weevils, and the newly named sponge moth, formerly known as gypsy moth, plus all the good guys who are rattling the ecology of our forests. Dr. Clark will explore with us what is happening and help us understand what this means for us going forward. Um, this is a Cornwall, I'm going to start calling this Green Tent Events. It is sponsored by the Cornwall Conservation Trust, the Cornwall Conservation Commission, the Cornwall Association, and the Cornwall Library. So with that, I introduce Dr. Rob Clark. Thank you for that excellent introduction. I'm uh, really happy to be here, folks. This is one of my best attended seminars so far uh, since moving back to Connecticut in 2021. I'm pretty excited. Oh, excuse me. I forgot two little items. Sure, Let go for it. Uh, we're going to uh, keep people muted. So you're going to have to uh, enter your questions in the chat and I'll deliver them, them afterwards. And um, that that's just, just that little bit of uh, minutia. OK, go ahead. Thank you. Um, let me just get my screen all set up here. All right. We on full screen? Yep. Excellent. Thank you. All right, folks. Uh, let's get started here. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Rob Clark. Uh, I'm here to talk about bugs. We're going to have a good time. Um, I'll tell you a little about myself. Um, just a little, very briefly um, about some of our current research, and then I'll go into the main parts of the talk. I'll give like 10 minutes to beneficial insect species, and I think that's a good place to start. And then, because really, when you have invasive species or pest species, something has gone wrong, and we want to use sort of a beneficial or neutral species as a starting point and in comparison. And then, uh, I got some emails on some of the heavy hitters of invasive insects that are common in Connecticut forests. And we'll talk about these, everything from a little ash borer and the spongy moth, which are pretty visible pests in Connecticut forests to some of the newer things like spotted lanternfly and beech leaf disease. And I'll, you know, this is a state of the art. I'll tell you guys what I know in terms of our current research on these insects. So I won't go into detail about my professional history because we kind of already did the intro, but I lived for five years on the West Coast as a postdoc and research professor studying uh, aphids and weevils. Uh, and originally from Connecticut where I did my master's and PhD and I studied things like ants and caterpillars in Connecticut forest. So it's really nice to be back home. And um, 
I've worked with a lot of different insect groups in different parts of the country, and it's given me some nice perspective as an entomologist on what to do about invasive species, or at least how to study them. So I, I'm not really a professor anymore. Um, I do collaborate with academics, but I currently work as an independent scientist for nonprofit and private groups. Um, my field program is based out of Great Hollow in New Fairfield, Connecticut, where I'm sort of their in-house entomologist and insect ecologist. And then I do statistics and computer programming for this uh, environmental consulting group that I started with some friends of mine who were also ecologists, sort of like an environmental consulting company. Um, and this is for our, our work with for-profit groups or private groups. Um, so I'm going to be focusing on, you know, this, my role here as an entomologist. And then at home, uh, I am the backpacking dad. I carried my son Elliot on the Appalachian Trail when we do family hikes. And here's me with him hiking uh, on the Appalachian Trail, actually pretty close to you guys. So we'll start with a, a meditation here. Uh, winter is on its way out, thankfully. Um, so imagine we're hiking on the first, that first like really sunny day in April where the canopy is still open in the forest. Maybe there's mountain laurel is still green like in this picture on the right. Uh, it's just that first day, it feels really, really warm. Um, and we come across something like uh, painted trillium. This is one of our uh, you know, really beautiful spring ephemerals that we see in April and May. And they're out there basking in the sun. And you know, we hike a little bit more and we see dustman's breeches and trout lily and spring beauty. Uh, these are plants that are taking advantage of the open canopy in spring. The, the trees haven't leafed out yet. So all this, the solar radiation is coming to the forest floor. These plants have a very short life cycle and they, pr they produce leaves and flowers and seeds really within a few weeks or a few months um, of in that really, really critical early spring period. And you know, if you were really curious about them, you might try to do something like collect some seeds and grow them in your garden, which probably wouldn't work. They really like forests. Um, but if you ever collected seeds of these, they're covered in these like weird, sticky, oily appendages. It's like, like a fruit, but not quite. Um, and that's because these are ant dispersed plants. This is a relatively uncommon dispersal strategy for plants, where instead of producing a fruit that's attractive to birds or mammals, Spring ephemerals will actually produce a fruit that's attractive to ants. And they produce this protein and lipid rich appendage called an eliosome. And it's just like the perfect little lunch for ants. And um, they collect these seeds and bring it back to their nest. And um, these are actually also called myrmecochores is the name of the types of plants here uh, or eliosome bearing plants. So not just any ant is dispersing these seeds. There's actually uh, one genus of ants which don't have a, a common, they have a couple common names, but not like a widely used one. They mainly go by their scientific name. If you see in the woods and ask you like, hey, what are you? I'm a phenogaster. Um, and they are described as a keystone mutualist because they're the primary ant that disperses these seeds. Um, when they're not eating the eliosomes on trout lily and trillium, there are just common scavengers of dead insects in the litter layer of the forest. Uh, they're just mind boggling abundant. If you have ever hiked or gone out in the woods and kicked over a log and saw hundreds of tiny little black ants streaming out of it, it's probably a phenogaster. Um, colonies can occupy pretty much every rotten log in the forest, reaching 200 ants per square meter, which makes them not only the most common ant species in Connecticut, they're probably the most common insect in Connecticut, and they might actually be the most common insect in the Eastern US. And this is my opinion as entomologist that has worked with them. There is nothing that comes close to their abundance. It's like the common forest ant. By dispersing seeds for these plants, the ants actually protect the seeds from natural enemies like rodents and weevils, which will destroy the seeds if they consume them. As I mentioned, the plants have a very short period of time where they have sunlight available. So they can't put that much energy into making seeds. They can only make a few on each seed pod. Ants are a really good mutualist because they're always active in the spring and they'll move these seeds to really high quality sites like their um, waste piles in their colonies. Uh, and these waste piles are called middens and it's a great germination site. It's essentially the dump where they put all their dead and their waste food and things like that. So it's also like this really high quality location. So next time you're 
taking a walk and you see some spring wildflowers, you know, you could thank your local Aphenogaster ant colony for helping them find a nutrient rich microsite where the seeds can germinate and helping protect them from natural enemies like rodents and weevils. Uh, and I am almost certain no one here has even heard of the genus of Phenogaster, um, but it's gotta be one of the most common insects in Connecticut and probably one of the most ecologically important. Um, so I'm starting here as an example. This would be considered what I would think a beneficial insect. Um, they're never pests of, of homes like, or gardens, like carpenter ants can be structural pests, garden ants, not surprisingly by their name, can be pests of gardens and tend to aphids and food, things like that. Um, they're, you know, primarily found in the forest. They only live in the litter layer, so they're not even damaging trees. Uh, they don't consume live, live plants. I told you their scavengers are eating dead insects, dispersing seeds, so they're not herbivores. They're not causing any damage to trees or understory plants, um, and they're mutuals for a really beautiful wildflowers that people love. So I would say this is like our starting point. Most insects are like this, where they play some really important role in forest ecosystems, in agricultural systems, and we sort of just don't even notice them because they're there doing their job. And unless you're an entomologist that studies insects very closely, um, you know, they never would come into your house and never bother you. So now that we've talked about beneficial insects, um, we can get into some of the baddies here. And this is the main thrust of our talk. So we're gonna talk about invasive insects in Connecticut forests. Um, this is a picture I took on Mount Higby in Middlefield, Connecticut. If anyone's been there, it's a really fantastic forest. It's uh, full of these hickory trees. Uh, it's also an area where ash trees have been historically very common. And this is one of the first places in Connecticut that got hit by emerald ash borer. Um, when I was a graduate student at Wesley and I did field work in these forests on the hickory trees studying tree hoppers and ants and caterpillars. And when I came back to visit a few years ago, all the ash trees were completely decimated. It was like someone had come through and something had come through and killed all of them. That was emerald ash borer, which is I think at this point right now our worst and most famous invasive insect in the state of Connecticut. Um, so the structure of this forest is different and I'm sure some of you in your adventures outside have seen really significant impacts of insects or really significant changes in forests that you suspect might be due to insects. So I, I said bad insects, I said good insects, um, but like insects don't have like morality these are just human designations. These are things that we uh, decide based on our management goals, how we wanna see forests managed, whether it's for timber harvest or for wildlife or just for hiking or for research. And there's this really great book uh, that I used in my entomology class when I taught as a professor called Forest Health and Protection. And I took a screenshot of this. This is like my favorite figure in this whole textbook. It summarizes applied entomology in one figure. And I promise is the only data-driven figure that I'll give in this whole talk. The rest are just cool pictures of books. Uh, but I'll refer back to this a few times. Um, when we talk about bad insects, I mean insects that cause some damage that we don't particularly like. And it's easy to define in something like a forestry scenario where we're trying to manage trees for timber harvest. And there's like an economic threshold where uh, we have things like chronic pests, where every year they do economic damage to trees and reduce the, the growth of those trees, and someone is losing money at the end of the day. Then we have periodic pests, where sometimes they don't really cause any economic damage, they don't reduce the growth of trees or anything like that. Some years there's a lot of damage and they have really significant impacts. And then we have things called latent pests, which are most insects, which they go through outbreaks and you know, they have periods of time where they're relatively rare and there'll be an outbreak again. But even their outbreak year, they don't cause economic damage. Um, the trees are able to tolerate the amount of damage they do. Their outbreaks aren't that intense and so forth. And these are a lot of native insects uh, fit in this latent pest category. But we get native periodic pests and native chronic pests. So this line right here that I pointed to with the yellow arrow, that's our, our threshold of when the insect is starting to interfere with some human desired outcome. I talked about negative impact on timber harvest, but it could be something like we see start to see negative impact on wildlife, for example. Um, 
maybe our management goal is just to preserve the oaks and maples in the forest and that's it. Like we just want them to have it a really healthy oak and maple forest. And you know, our threshold for management is gonna be really low because you don't wanna see any damage to those trees. Maybe it's something like Great Hollow, this research station I work at, we're trying to have a very passive management strategy and really not do anything. We just wanna study as scientists so our threshold is extremely high. It's gotta be something really catastrophic before we take any action. Um, I wanna make this point that this location of the salon is subjective and it's based on your management decisions. If you're a property owner, if you're a land trust, if you're a research station, if you're a state government and so forth. This is a thing that's set by humans, not by the insects. So let's talk about uh, a couple of latent pests. Um, you probably are not familiar with most of them because you know they, they're not pests most of the time. In fact, they're never pests. Um, this is the copper underwing caterpillar. It's also called Amphipora pyramidoides is its Latin name. I just love saying that. And it has this uh, pyramid shaped butt on the back. These are big caterpillars. They're really abundant in the spring in like late May. And they uh, form this like kind of drab looking brown moth that actually has really brightly colored copper colored underwings. That's how it gets its name. Um, they go through outbreaks where in some years there's a lot of them and they're really easy to find. You, you go and you look on any oak tree or maple tree, you probably would find one of these caterpillars. Some years they're pretty rare and not that easy to find. But I don't know of any instances where they've caused economic damage or reached some pest threshold that people are concerned about. Um, this is a native species that feeds on a wide range of hosts but it never is a, a pest, it's this latent pest. Um, but it might have the potential to because it does have outbreaks. Latent pests are latent because food webs are regulating populations as they should be. Um, there's no human intervention is required to manage populations of things like the maple spanworm. Uh, if you go and look at a red maple, you might see it has tiny little holes over the leaves in like June or maybe early July. And it's caused by this caterpillar, which is, you go to any red maple tree, you're probably gonna find the lesser maple spanworm. It's, it's crazy common, but it um, never really causes economic damage. So it would just, it would be more money than it's worth to try to control them. And their populations are regulated by food webs. One thing I always want to know as an insect ecologist is, you know, what is working to maintain some insect populations below damage thresholds? And what is going wrong when they go above these thresholds that people care about? Uh, the short answer is, well, half the answer I should say is natural enemies. Ants eat caterpillars, our migratory songbirds eat caterpillars, and they do a pretty good job of keeping their populations in check. They've co-evolved with these insects and are able to find them and overcome their, their defenses. Not that Amphipora pyramidoides is a very well defended caterpillar. In fact, it's quite tasty and juicy to birds. And you want a food web, a well managed forest, a well managed farm, whatever it is, that has multiple predator groups to keep insect populations in check. So, ants are good, small predators of small, very, very small insects like young caterpillars. We have fungal pathogens that it can attack insects, they're considered a natural enemy. And we have songbirds. And there's other, other things that help regulate populations. There's viral pathogens that attack insects. There's uh, spiders, there's predatory beetles. And generally speaking, the more predators you have, the better. Um, not always the case, but typically. And these are the things that are functioning when we haven't really messed with the system too much. Another component that's really important is plant health. And this is one that comes up more frequently in like landscaping or urban environments. Um, those are stressful situations for plants. They're not able to defend themselves as well. And when plant health suffers, they're not able to mount the defense against insects. So oak trees, for example, will produce tannins and other compounds that will hamper the growth of caterpillars, not allow them to complete development. If these trees are stressed, they don't have sufficient water, there's competition, they don't have sufficient nutrients in the soil, they're gonna be susceptible to insect outbreaks. And in a healthy, quote unquote, healthy forest where the trees have all the resources they need, their immune systems function very well. And it actually complements the natural enemies. So caterpillars on really healthy trees grow slower. It takes them longer to develop. And that's more opportunities for predators to bump into them and find them and eat them. 
Um, so this is what we mentioned in the beginning. Uh, this thing called tritrophic interactions is a nice fancy technical term for this. Uh, it's just the combination of plant health and natural enemies. Those are the two things that regulate insect populations. When those break down, that's when you have problems. I think as a biologist, that research on latent pests are very underappreciated. Uh, in the same way, in the medical community, there's been a recent push to not just study people who are sick and have illnesses, but also to study healthy people and see what they're doing to stay healthy has provided a lot of insight into human health. I think the same thing should be thought of for insects and other organisms that are important in the environment. And we should study the insects where things are working as they should, and they'll give us insight into why things are going wrong with pest species. But I'm gonna say that because I'm an insect ecologist and I, I wanna go out and do field work on cool caterpillars like this. Okay. So I know a, a bunch of you are here probably to talk about emerald ash borer and I'll tell you what I know in just a few minutes. There's a lot to this insect um, and I can't spend the whole time on it. So some new invasive species would fall into that category of chronic pests once they reach a new area, when they're introduced and then year after year after year, they cause significant problems, death of trees, economic losses, negative impacts on wildlife, pretty much until that population leaves because they've run out of hosts, um, which is the case in emerald ash borer. So they're chronic pests as long as they're in that location. Uh, this is the current range map. Well, it's actually uh, getting out of date now. This is five years old. Um, they're pretty much everywhere. There's ash trees at this point. Um, all of the counties in Connecticut have had emerald ash borer for quite a while now. And you know, if you're an outdoor enthusiast, you've seen the impacts of this. It's, it's gotta be the most dramatic and significant invasive species of this century, uh, of the 2000s. So chronic pests have these consistently negative impacts as long as they're in a given habitat. So here we're looking at that figure again, economic threshold, management threshold is way down here. Every year, they're, if they're, they're in a location with ash trees, they are a problem. Great example of a chronic pest. I think they're a good example. The op, they're the opposite end of the spectrum of a phenogaster, the ant that helps disperse seeds for wildflowers. Um, this is as bad of an insect as you can get. They're, they cause economic damage. Even if you're not a forester and you're trying to harvest trees for, you know, for profit, the tree death becomes a safety issue and you have to pay money to take the tree down sometimes. As negative impacts on wildlife, there are lots of species that depend on the seeds and the actual trees themselves as, as homes. Uh, and then it's causing the decline of a native species. Our green and white ash in Connecticut were an port, important component of our forests, especially forests with um, certain types of soils like riparian areas, areas, areas near lakes and streams. And it's really decimated them. Um, Buprestids is the family of these beetles. Um, the emerald ash borer, have all but removed ash trees from our landscape. This is a picture from a red maple swamp that also had ash trees in it. And this is a picture of like late fall and they're, they are toast. What happens with this insect species is the beetle bores into the bark and then the larvae feed on the inside of the bark and you see these exit holes as the adults emerge. The problem here is that uh, the ash trees, this is a really a symptom of the fact there's no natural enemies. They've been introduced from Asia their natural enemies were not present in the environment. And so there's none of this control from natural enemies. And then the ash trees have had no exposure to them. So their immune defenses that normally would work against other buprestids that are native don't work against them. So in this case, the invasive species has escaped control from both angles. Um, there are researchers in, with the Forest Service and the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station that are trying to do things like release natural enemies that only feed on emerald ash borer. I think that's a, you know, a valiant effort. Um, but the problem if you're a property manager right now um, is that the emerald ash borer is here and it's doing damage and it has been for the last five years. Um, at the end, we'll have time for questions. Uh, this is a slide that's normally from, you know, my talks that are more about forest management. So conventional insecticide control uh, can be used on small scales, like in landscaping situations, like you have an ash tree you want to protect. Um, but generally for most forest pests, unless it's a really, really, really valuable stand of trees, um, you know, it's not really economically viable to do something like call in a helicopter and spray for insects. And that's the case. Um, 
And there's also, of course, you know, concerns about doing stuff like aerial sprays in areas like land trusts or places where people hike. So there's not really like a good quick solution for any of these problems, unfortunately. And the quick solutions are kind of, uh, kind of extreme, I should say. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, Emerald Ash Borer is a really good case of without natural enemies or a host plant that is able to mount an effective immune response, their population just grow out of control. You have hundreds of thousands of insects attacking trees at the same time, and it actually will effectively girdle the tree so it can't move nutrients up and down its trunk, and that's destroying the vascular system of the tree and it can kill them in a year or two. So a hemlock woolly adelgid is another invasive insect that has become established. Uh, it was introduced to the US, Northeastern US around 1950, and the decline of hemlocks are very significant in Southern New England. Uh, also in the Mid-Atlantic region too, it's actually been, been worse. Uh, I took a trip to um, Virginia recently, not recently, it's been a while now, um, and there are there's areas of the, that state where entire hemlock forests have been destroyed. And actually in Shenandoah National Forest, um, it's, it's quite significant. So this is an example of a periodic pest, I think, that fits in this category. So hemlock woolly delgid has been here for a while. As I mentioned, it's been here for 70 years. And there are years where it doesn't really do that much damage to the hemlocks. They're there, they're feeding on them, but it doesn't kill the trees. And then there are really bad years, if anyone has tracked some hemlock trees in their yard or at a park, where the trees just get hammered by this. And in that case, it can cause the trees to die, which if we're concerned about management of conifers, especially these trees that are very important at producing shade in the spring, they make this really interesting Microhabitat, you ever noticed hemlock forests are very cold, they have acidic soils, and the loss of the trees kind of removes that microhabitat. Um, Eastern hemlock is one of the most susceptible species to hemlock woolly adelgid, but it's also an invasive species on the west coast where it affects western hemlocks. So this is the current range map for um, hemlock woolly adelgid. It's pretty much any forest area on the west coast, any forested area on the east coast up through the Great Lakes region. Since we've been able to study this, I'm saying we as entomologists, um, I don't actually work on hemlock woolly adelgid, but I'll tell you what I've learned from my, my colleagues. Since this has been studied, it looks like one of the main mechanisms by which hemlock woolly adelgid has these really significant outbreaks is if there's a very mild winter. Mm -hmm. Normally what's required to happen for the tree to actually mount an effective defense against hemlock woolly adelgid is a very, very cold winter that actually is, um, damages the buds a little bit, but it really, really hurts the insects uh, as they overwinter inside the tissue of the plant. Due to climate change, or the fact that these plants are in really warm regions of the US, there are not really cold winters and it doesn't really knock down these pests every few years and keep them in check. So actually the healthiest hemlock trees right now are in areas that are particularly cold or really protected environments. Um, so hemlock can tolerate this extreme cold, and that will help it mount its defense against hemlock woolly adelgid, um, but it's really a required component. So tree health is negatively impacted by warm environments, whether it's climate change or actually just where the tree has been planted or cultivated, that really hampers its ability to fight off these pests. Um, there's also work on trying to introduce natural enemies for some time now, and it's actually um, been effective, but really large scale biocontrol operations are kind of difficult to pull off. You can't just introduce a new natural enemy everywhere in the US simultaneously. It's logistically impossible to do something like that. Um, so I got some pictures from someone's email, rockwoodfarm at optoonline.net. I don't know who it was. They're just forwarded to me. I assume this is somewhere in Cornwall. This is a good example of trees that are um, struggling to fight off hemlock woolly delgid. Uh, definitely with those sort of white little uh, puffs. That's actually the poop of the woolly adelgid. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, they just have this cotton candy type of poop. Uh, and in this, in this scenario is a good situation where the hemlock, you know, looks like it's not able to mount some effective defense against them. Um, I talked to a forester 
forest ecologist recently, and her opinion is that due to hemlock willy adelgid, the only locations where hemlocks are really healthy anymore in Connecticut are shady ravines where it's very cold and there's a lot of water and nutrients you know, sort of running down the ravines so the trees get enough food um, to defend themselves against hem hemlock willy adelgid. So in Connecticut, this tree species without management intervention is gonna be relegated to those environments where they can perform really well and defend themselves against hemlock willy adelgid. Um, so locations like um, field edges, backyards, um, open forests are places where hemlock willy adelgid is gonna be susceptible to this year after year after year. Okay. Next up is Lymantria dispar. Uh, it was gypsy moth until a few months ago, and it was changed to spongy moth, which is actually based on its name in Quebec and France. It's an insect native to Europe and Asia. And I'll call it, I call it Lymantria dispar. I'm an entomologist, so I try to use scientific names, but I also like spongy moth. Spongy moth is a weird name. I'll get used to it. Uh, I voted, I'm a member of the Entomological Society of America. I voted for great destructor moth. I thought that was a pretty badass name for that insect, uh, but I did not win in that poll. So spongy moth it is. Uh, 10 caterpillars are often confused with spongy moths. Here's a picture of a 10 caterpillar nest in our black cherry tree with my friend Tyga, who was a friend of mine when I was in grad school at Wesleyan. Um, People often are like, oh, I have gypsy moths, and then they show me, and it's just a tent caterpillar. These are native insects. They are actually normally specialized on cherry trees or things in the uh, family. So like, they can also be on like uh, plums and apples, but mainly they're on cherry trees. Gypsy moths, spongy moths, don't actually build a tent. That's a common misconception. If you see a tent, it's not the spongy moth. Um, the spongy moth, I, I, I'll have a picture of this in a minute, they actually form this like spongy egg mass and that's how they get their, their new common name. So Lymantria dispar was introduced in 1900. As far as events, invasive insects, this was like a really early introduction. There are actually repeated new introductions of invasive Lymantria dispar to the US. It's actually not an invasive yet in Washington state in California and Oregon because the USDA Forest Service is like doing pretty significant work to try to prevent it from being introduced there. Um, there's this really crazy story about someone trying to breed this with silk moths in Massachusetts and then there was a hurricane and they escaped. It's like some mad scientist stuff from 1900. Um, but it was introduced to in New England 120 years ago and since then has been a significant problem, especially in or forest dominated by oak trees. So it causes economic damage in some years. So this is a picture of the uh, caterpillars resting on a trunk. Here's the adults laying eggs. And this is how it gets its new common name, the spongy moth. There's like spongy egg masses. This is on a chestnut oak tree. Um, I, recent, I, I suspect in near you guys, for those of you who are in Cornwall, um, you're probably gonna have a gypsy moth outbreak along the Appalachian Trail right now because the picture I showed at the beginning of me hiking with my son, there are a lot of these egg masses and that's usually an indicator that an outbreak is coming in a year or two. Um, so keep your eye out for one of these. And, and there probably was an outbreak recently because I knew there was a big one in Sharon just, uh, just nearby. So the outbreaks make it, things look like winter in the forest canopy, if it's a forest dominated by oaks and beaches, that's one of their preferred hosts. Lymantria is a really broad um, generalist. It's called a highly polyphagous. It feeds on many different types of trees, but oaks are its favorite and those are where it does very, very well. They'll entirely denude the canopy. Oak trees are very, very tough, resilient trees. They can actually survive this um, and they can survive it sometime for a couple of years in a row. But if they're weakened by you know, some environmental stresses, competition, uh, or if the outbreak is really bad for multiple years in a row, that's when you start seeing you know, mortality of trees. It's one of those insect pests where things can look way worse than they actually are. And the worst part is kind of psychological where you're just like, oh my God, there's so many caterpillars everywhere. And then like their poop rains down from the sky because they're feeding in the canopy. Uh, is, you know, it's not very fun. The trees can tolerate it for a year or two, but after that, you know, they start to, to not do so well. 
the promising thing about Lymantra dispar, it's been here for 120 years, and it looks like ecology and evolution are sort of uh, catching up. When we have really cool wet springs, in years where there's a lot of gypsy moth caterpillars, spongy moth caterpillars, they'll actually knock down the populations. And this is due to a fungus that attacks them. So what happens in a cool wet spring, there's a lot of moisture in the air. There's a fungal pathogen that completes this entire life cycle inside the caterpillar, kills the host, and then spreads to another one. And it's very, very similar to fungal pathogens that attack some caterpillars of this genus, which are, were targeted as biocontrol agents where you know, the Forest Service are trying to introduce them, um, do some lab studies, et cetera. Um, but no one knows where this one came from. If it's native, it's, if it's non-native, it essentially came out of nowhere and is the new natural enemy of gypsy moths. So as long as we have cool, wet spring seasons, um, this thing should be doing a good job keeping these populations in check. But by in check, I mean, they're no longer chronic pests. They're, you know, in the 70s and 80s and 90s, there were really a lot of outbreaks. I wasn't around then. I was born in 85. Um, but I've heard stories from people in the 80s where like in Connecticut, you know, you drive on the highway and it was like, it looked like winter. Uh, I've never seen anything like that. We had some pretty serious outbreaks um, in, you know, the mid 2000s, but um, nothing like what had happened historically. And I imagine here something like this is like an economic threshold is this line where, you know, every year, 10 or 20 years, this is a really bad outbreak. So Lymantria is formerly this chronic pest that has become a periodic pest. This is my opinion as entomologist who's studied caterpillars a little bit because there's a new natural enemy um, that's able to keep them in check a little bit. So unless their conditions are really favorable, they're not gonna have these really you know, exploding out population outbreaks, but they're still gonna have them sometimes. Okay. So let's talk about the next one. These are another group of pictures from the same uh, person. This is textbook uh, beach, or beach bark disease or beach blister disease, uh, two common names for it. Um, I forget which is the formal correct name. Uh, it causes this blistering on the bark. For a lot of invasive insects or native insects for that matter, the worst damage they do isn't from the fact that they're abundant or they feed a lot on the tree, it's the fact they carry pathogens. It's like mosquitoes are very dangerous insects. One mosquito can't kill you, but they can transmit a pathogen that can. Um, if you're in parts of South America and you're bit by a mosquito, you can get malaria. If you're in Connecticut in a year where there's something like equine encephalitis, it's really dangerous. Um, the same type of dynamic, dynamics happen with plants. Insects carry a lot of pathogens. This is what I mainly focused my research on when I was on the West Coast and still do work on this, especially sap feeding insects like beach scale. They're like the mosquitoes of the insect world. They feed on the plant sap, which is like the vascular tissue of the plant. And in doing so, they're gonna actively transmit any pathogens that are in their gut into the, that host. This Neonectria fungi is actually what causes the symptoms you see in the tree and the mortality of these. Um, so beach scale, Cryptococcus fagasuga is a species. It's a non-native insect that was introduced uh, from European beaches. It's a common pest in European beach forests. Introduced to the US, I don't actually know the exact time point, um, fairly recently, in the last 50 years, I believe. Uh, and this is a picture of the insect. They're super tiny. You need a microscope or a loop to see them. Um, but as they feed on the bark of the tree and the inner bark, they transmit a fungal spore which then causes that blistering. Uh, the last thing I'll say about this is I talked to an arborist about this and um, this insect. And it's one I've, I worked on beaches as a graduate student, not on this insect, but on this tree species. My, my experience with this insect and when it is worst is in areas where you have a lot of beech trees. And essentially you have areas where you can get really, really high populations of beech scales and a really high rate of infection in beech trees. And it's actually like solitary beech trees that are like on a farm or in someone's yard somewhere that are actually the most well defended because they're not near other sick beech trees. Um, also, I believe that there's a really strong component of uh, freezing uh, frost stress. So trees that are exposed to, unlike the Hemlopoly example, really, really cold temperatures seem probably to make this pathogen worse. 
because uh, it could weaken the bark and the tree's ability to defend themselves. Okay, so those those are some of the big ones that are just you go we go if we were to go on a hike we'd probably find the impacts of those. Here's some new exciting stuff on the horizon that you may or may not see um, in your travels, but you should keep your eye out for. We'll talk about beech leaf disease and the spotted lanternfly. So spotted lanternfly is actually from China and its main host plant is Tree of Heaven, which is an invasive tree in the Northeast, but it feeds on a lot of different things. It was first established in 2014 in Pennsylvania. And then, you know, it's been what, six years? And it is covering most of the mid-Atlantic and is now making its way into New England. This map here, which you can find on the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program, shows where we have infestations of this insect and then where it's been spotted, no pun intended. And you see it's in like half the counties in Connecticut, it's been spotted and it's, there's an established population in Norwalk. Um, mm. I'm gonna go check that out this summer. That's on my, my uh, bucket list. I've never seen these because they're still rare in the state of Connecticut, but they're, gonna, they're not gonna be uh, rare. They're gonna be common eventually, I believe, based on what's happened in other parts of the US. Um, it's generally a pest of vineyards and ornamental trees. Their preferred host, as I said, is tree of heaven, but then they move other, over to other native plants after they deplete that food source and they can reach really, really high abundances. This is a big insect. Most hemipterans are small, like aphids or stink bugs are kind of big hemipterans. These are huge. There's a picture of one covering um, the trunk of someone's tree in you know, the yard. And it's kind of a spooky picture. It's like, you know, kids toys in there. Like, this is not a kind of an insect that people generally enjoy having in their backyard. Um, and then here's a bunch of nymphs uh, crawling on a tree as well. And this is like a tree of heaven. Really, it's an insect that reaches profoundly high numbers very quickly. And then will disperse in large numbers somewhere else. And we've only had a couple of years to really learn about their biology in the US. So a large number of eggs and nymphs can be seen on tree of heaven in particular. So if you have a lot of tree of heaven, the suggestion is to keep an eye on it. And there's actually some places where the management recommendation is to actually remove a tree of heaven, um, which is not easy. It's an invasive tree for a reason, and it can grow really, really well in um, urban environments. So, okay, I'm not a literature expert, but I'm pretty sure um, a tree that grows in Brooklyn is about tree of heaven. Um, it, it's like the tree you see in like really like I'm saying like urban areas. Tree of heaven is, um, and it's a really good host for these insects because it's their native host from China. So it's unclear how much of a forest pest this will be. Um, at first, it looks like it's mainly a pest of vineyards and ornamental plants, um, but there, I know I've heard rumors that foresters and other land managers are concerned about it because it can just, once it de depletes some of these host plants, it will move into more natural environments and feed on things like walnuts and sycamores. It's so early in its invasion that it's unclear if it can kill walnuts and sycamores, uh, but mainly the fact it reaches these high densities is just a concern enough for people. Uh, it's something they would like to not have, you know, a billion of these just show up on their doorstep one day. Okay, beech leaf disease is caused, actually not by an insect, by an internally feeding nematode. Nematodes are small animals, not microscopic, not uh, bacteria or protozoa or anything like that. Very, very tiny insect, or very, very tiny animals, not insects. I even make that mistake sometimes. They feed internally on plants. This is a picture I took in Great Hollow. Uh, I checked with a, a biologist, a plant pathologist, and this is indeed an example of beech leaf disease. It was introduced from probably from Asian beaches, unlike the beach scale disease, which came from European beaches. And there's kind of an interesting story about this. It's, it's probably been here for a while and we just didn't know. So it was first recorded in Ohio, and then bulletins went out to try to sample and look for it in the rest of the Northeast. And so many reports came in, it sort of overwhelmed the biologists. So in Connecticut, it sort of went from no one knew it was here to it's in every county almost overnight. Uh, and that's because no one was looking for it. It's, you can never see the adult. This is actually what the insect looks like, a nematode. I keep saying insect just because I've been saying insect for the whole talk. Um, this nematode here feeding, this is a root feeding nematode picture. They're tiny, these are like plant cells that it's feeding on. But there's a bunch of plant diseases that are caused by nematodes. They feed internally in their plants. And it's unclear how negative an impact this is gonna have on American beaches. 
Because if you notice in the previous slide, you know, it's only been reported in the last two years in Connecticut, but it's everywhere. Given the fact that beach already has an invasive pathogen it has to deal with, um, I am concerned about it. I like American beech trees, and I would, I'm hoping this is not as bad as like emerald ash borer. Um, we shall see. OK. Coming around the bend here, maybe some good news. Uh, quarantines, they are important. There has been some successful quarantines. So Asian longhorn beetle is one that I think I got, you know, was mentioned in email and it, you hear a lot about, but it's actually a, uh, an invasive pest that's been kept under control. There's unintentional introductions every now and then, but due to the fact that they're really, they're huge beetles, they can't move very far um, as adults. They attack things like maple trees are one of the preferred hosts. What happens is if some are introduced, uh, state governments, the Forest Service goes in and will treat every tree with an insecticide or just cut them down and wood chip them and essentially just try to knock out that population. And so we have an active, this is, I just went on the PPQ federal database for this. Uh, Asian longhorn beetle is a quarantine in Worcester. It's a quarantine in Long Island. There's no quarantines in the Connecticut, you'll notice. Good, let's keep it that way. Don't move firewood, cross state lines. Um, and it's been here since 1996. So I'd consider that a success story. Sometimes containment and putting the money forward to contain insect species uh, is effective. So that's why I think it's important to do that. There are, there are success stories. It's not all bad news. You just don't hear about it. Like, why would you hear about an insect that's successfully contained? Okay. What I want to take, what, what I want you to take away, these are some big picture ideas. Some insects are good. Some insects are okay, and some insects are worse than others. Um, healthy forests, those that have a lot of natural enemies, ants, birds, fungi, and healthy plants, we haven't messed with their, um, their environment too much. Those plants are able to mount a good immune defense against insects. Those are the places where we can help prevent, those are the ways we can help prevent pest outbreaks. Uh, Connecticut is home to a lot of interesting insects. I've talked about, you know, what, 10 of them today? There's, you know, probably 200,000 species of insects in Connecticut. I'm not exaggerating. Um, we've just talked about a tiny fraction of them. Only a few are really problematic invasives, um, but because they're so ecologically important as invasive species, they're worth studying and trying to quarantine if we can. Um, there's lots of other takeaways, but I think these are the top three. So I think. What I would do now is I will stop talking and I will give people an opportunity to ask questions. And um, did you, do you have questions? I do have a couple. Um, okay. Could you kind of speak backwards from trees? Like what, one question was about what's killing maple. So can you sort of talk about certain species that are particularly under fire, what comes to them? I, I don't know what's killing maples right now. That's new to me. Um, okay. So like the trees okay. that are trees that are in decline in Connecticut mm -hmm. are ash and hemlocks for sure. There's no question about that. Um, there these two invasive pests have been reducing their populations year after year. Um, I I worry that beech might be on that list soon due to the fact there's two invasives, but it's not the case yet. Um, other trees like oaks and cherries and things like that, uh, and maples, this is just, you know, what I've heard are doing okay. They have, there's some pests that attack them, but they're not declining like ash and hemlock. Okay. Can you talk about, um, thank you. Can you talk about, uh, what to do with, um, specific infestations? For instance, if you see the woolly adelgid, mm -hmm. what do you do? And what, if you see the gypsy moth, what do you do? Yeah. So this is, this is like uh, when you ask someone medical advice and they say, you should call your doctor, talk to your primary care physician, call an arborist. Um, I'm an entomologist. I can make recommendations, but I can't give you medical advice. Um, I talked to a friend of mine who is an arborist at the beginning, and he's my go-to person. He, asks, he, he sends me bug questions. I send him pest treatment questions. Generally, there you have conventional and organic control options, uh, organic pesticides, traditional, conventional insecticides, what they're called, um, or maybe something like a neonicotinoid, 
that's applied to the, the leaves or applied to the roots of the plant so the plant can take it up. Um, but any one of these pests, the effectiveness of the treatment is going to depend on like what environment you're treating it in. What's the scale of treatment? Are you trying to save the one hemlock tree in your yard or a forest of hemlocks? Um, and how much money do you want to spend on it? And that's a conversation that needs to be had with an arborist. Um, I know hemlock willy delge is one I get questions a lot. Uh, I've heard that root treatments using imidacloprid can work pretty good uh, if you're willing to use an insecticide like that. Mm -hmm. But again, that's a, you know, talk to an arborist because they're going to be the one that has the license to actually apply these things. Okay, where do you find arborists? Is that just something in the... Uh, yeah, there's the, um, I just looked it up before this. There's the Connecticut, um, Connecticut Consortium of Arborists. That's not the name. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch of arborist groups in the state of Connecticut. Um, if you look in, you know, Google, phone book, um, I, my friend, the friend of mine and my brother both work for Bartlett Tree Experts, which is the big arborist corporation that covers oh, there most you of go. the U.S. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, one question straight up. What's your, what is your opinion of the future of my favorite forest tree, the American beech? Uh, it is uncertain. That's a great question. Um, I think the nice thing about the, not the nice thing, nice thing about beech is like, they're a very tough tree. They, it, there's something about them. I think may, if I like them, they just seem to be very tenacious. It's like a tree you see growing out of a rocky outcropping and forming little suckers that grow over. You chop it down and they come back. Um, I don't think it will be like the ash situation where we have an invasive insect. These two invasive pests are going to, you know, re relegate them to a rare species. Um, but it's too early to know for that beech leaf disease how bad it's going to be for them. Uh, I think that there are. It's going to be a tree where some areas it's going to decline significantly and some areas it's going to be fine. And that's just like my, that's like an opinion of an opinion of, mm -hmm. of the future of American beach. Mm -hmm. Why does the, um, in the ash borer, why does the uh, bark shred off like that? Um, those are the entrance and exit holes from the adults. So the adults are, are ovipositing inside the, um, the bark and the eggs are hatching and the larvae you're eating, they're finishing their life cycle and then the adults are exiting out and leaving that exit hole in the bark. And it will cause the, like, it'll, the bark to fragment and fall off as they do that. Okay. Also their bird, um, sap suckers and woodpeckers will actually try to eat them. And oh. our native birds do a good job of eating them. There's just too damn many of them. They can't keep up. Here's a good question. Does the Asian jumping worm degrade the soil and make invasives more dangerous? Is there anything that can be done? That's a new, I, I didn't know that was an invasive species. I, I didn't know about that invasive species um, until just a few months ago. So I haven't really done any research on it. Um, but I know it's one of the focal points of introductions is Western Connecticut. It's generally the case that non-native earthworms change the soil a lot including a lot of the lumbricids, those large like night crawlers, those are actually invasive species too. They're unintentionally spread along um, corridors with water by fishermen. They're actually from Europe. They're not native to uh, Northern climates. So they're, they change the soil and there's some evidence to suggest that it actually makes the soil more favorable to invasive plants, which kind of makes sense. You're altering the soil. So a species that does well in a disturbed environment might persist, um, but I that literature is still kind of being developed. So it's a good question. I don't know much about that earthworm species, but based on what I know in other ones, um, it could have negative effects on the plant community. And um, I want to give a shout out to Deb and Bruce Bennett, who are Rockwood Farm, who sent uh, in photographs for your talk so that we would have some good local uh, fodder to work with for this lecture. So uh, yeah, thank you to them. Thank you. And also they uh, put in a reference for people who are looking for arborists, the Connecticut Tree Protective Association. Yeah, that's it. So there you. you go, the Connecticut Tree Protective Association. And um, I'm going to give a last call for um, for questions. I think that pretty much covers it.
Oh, we got one. Should a tree be chopped down to avoid a spread or left for the birds to make a nest? What's attacking white birch? There, there is reddish mark, it says. Um, yeah, that's the, you know, removing the trees is, I, I don't know your, the situation you're in. It really depends on the management situation. I'm not trying to skirt that question. Um, yeah. If it's like a tree hanging out of your house, that's like a, talk to an arborist to make sure you're safe situation. Right. If you're a forest manager and you're trying to like maximize your, you know, what you're getting out of that plot of forest, that might be a scenario where you talk with a forest manager, a forester and ask like, is the best idea to just like chop everything and wood chip it so they don't spread to the other trees. Mm -hmm. um, in those two contexts, it's like a very different decision. If you're managing for wildlife, like this, like imagine I'm at Great Hollow, the nature center I work with, we had the ash, emerald ash borer has been devastating. And our opinion is unless it's hanging over a tra trail, we're just gonna leave it and let it run its course. Um, Cause we don't really have the funds to save every single ash tree there, but also we're kind of curious to see what happens. Mm -hmm. And those dead trees create snags that, you know, could be important um, nesting location for wildlife. So that's our management strategy in that situation. Yeah. Um, white birch, so white birch, um, is susceptible to this pathogen. It's a fungal pathogen called birch polypore. And to my knowledge, it's a native fungus. Then white birch seem to be declining in Connecticut, but it's not because of that pathogen. It's because white birch is an early successional forest species. It likes open forest gaps, usually something that comes from a farm or a pasture, and then it's allowed to regenerate from forest. White birch is one of the first trees to come back and they're very poor competitors in mature forests and their populations start to decline. So we're at that phase in Connecticut's history where most of the area that's natural is now a mature forest and the white birch are just not competitive in that scenario. They want young forests, that's where they live. Thank you. That, that was very interesting, I didn't know that. Um, okay, thank you, Lila, for asking this question. Uh, we have been recording this and I believe that recordings of this talk will be held both at the Cornwall Library and you'll also be able to access them through the Cornwall Conservation Trust website. So if, if you have friends that didn't get to see it, but have these similar questions, that's where you send them. So um, I think that's it. And um, unless there's one last, I think we got it. Awesome. Anyway, this was absolutely terrific, Rob. Ab you just answered all the questions prop that people had. And, and uh, oh, I have to say that we're gonna follow this up, of course, with one of our famous hikes and Rob will come and we will uh, be announcing that uh, on the Cornwall Conservation Trust website. Pretty soon it will also be in the Chronicle. So, but Rob will um, show us with real life situations what he's talking about. So we have that to look forward to probably in June. Yeah, I, I actually am thinking after talking about the uh, spring ephemerals that doing something in like April when all those flowers come out, um, that's like the best time to go hiking. All right, well, we'll work it too. in. Tune all right, in. thanks. Thanks for the great Thank questions. So that was awesome. Okay, this has been fabulous. Thank you so much, Rob. We really appreciate it. So bye for now, everybody. I think we're good. Cheers.